The topic for our webinar today, and this is part of the library's Wednesday at noon series, is um, depositing your research data in ICPSR. So, um, a little bit of background, first of all, of what ICPSR is. Um, besides something that if you try to say it too many times, your tongue just gets tied up in knots. Um, it's the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Science Research. And it was founded in the early 60s at the University of Michigan, primarily to disseminate data from the American National Election Studies ANES or AINES, not to be confused with Haines, the health and nutrition surveys um, that are also available through the ICPSR repository. And it started out with about 25 members and has grown to nearly 800 um, university, foundation, government institutions, and nonprofit members. The primary data archives of ICPSR are still primarily social and behavioral sciences. But ICPSR also hosts 21 specialized collections of data. Uh, excuse me, phone ringing, probably somebody selling me a warranty for my car. Um, the specialized collections cover education, aging, criminal justice, and so on. Um, and many of the thematic collections, which is how they group all of these, actually serve as the official data repositories for a number of government agencies. For example, the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data. Now about data sharing, um, 2013 was sort of the turning point for data sharing um, when the Office of Science and Technology Policy issued a memo that directed federal agencies with large expenditures in research and development to create plans to make scientific data funded by those agencies available to the public. NIH, NSF, and other agencies quickly did put policies in place that support archiving of data. Many of them require that data um, from funded projects be deposited in public archives. But it really isn't just a matter of policy. Among the reasons for sharing research data are that it reinforces open scientific inquiry, it encourages a diversity of analysis and opinions, it promotes new research and the testing of new research methods, um, it provides scrutiny that improves methods of data collection and measurement, um, it definitely reduces cost by avoiding duplicate data collection efforts. And it provides an important resource for training in research. Um, and actually in two weeks, I'll be doing another webinar, webinar looking specifically at some of the teaching tools embedded in ICPSR. So the options for depositing data in ICPSR, the easiest, the quick um, painless method is self-deposit in the open ICPSR repository. And that's basically, you take your data, you dump it in, it's immediately available, this is the quickest way to meet particularly journal publisher requirements for 
um, open access to data sets for replication purposes. The second option is to donate the data to the ICPSR member archive. That essentially takes the data and makes it available to ICPSR membership. Um, but the third option is to pay for the full ICPSR curation services. So what's the difference between these three? The open ICPSR option. This is a self-publishing repository for social, behavioral, and health sciences research data. Again, it's really useful for researchers who need to publish their raw data associated with a journal article to meet journal publisher requirements. It provides up to two gigabytes of storage space. The data is immediately published with a citation and persistent identifier that can be used in article publication. And it does in many ways meet funder requirements for shared data. However, for the most part, ICPSR doesn't improve or alter the data sets deposited in ICPSR. Basically, they're preserved as is, and they're distributed as they were deposited by the depositor. Investigators who are submitting data through open ICPSR have the entire responsibility for ensuring confidentiality. They have to indicate during the deposit process whether there's any identifiable or sensitive information, um, but that's essentially the burden of the depositor. Now, ICPR PSR does scan deposits to the open repository and may select data collections that meet their collection um, criteria to um, actually curate and add into the general archive. So the general member archive of ICPSR, um, if data meets the collection criteria for ICPSR, which is essentially um, that it's within the um, subject domains that are relevant, um, that it meets certain um, data production and management criteria. It can be processed at no charge to the researcher it's put into a queue with other member funded data collection. So it might take a little bit while to get deposited. It's not that instant availability that you get with the open ICPSR um, repository. The extent of the processing is actually determined by the attributes of the data and the documentation. And that data will then be made available to ICPSR member institutions at no cost, but individuals at non-member institutions would have to pay to access the data. Oh, I'm sorry, I just clicked. There we go. Um, an important thing to be aware of about that is that because that data would not then be publicly available to everyone, that might not meet, meet the requirements of some funding agencies or publishers. 
Then there's the full package, the full ICPSR curation. And that usually requires a one-time deposit and curation fee that is generally in the range of three to $8,000. Um, researchers can actually contact ICPSR when they're in the project development process to get better estimates of what that fee might be. But that's the avenue that's usually preferred for funded research with the expectation that those fees are included in the grant application budgets. And as most funding agencies now require some type of data management plan that includes plans for access to the data after completion of a project, it's more and more the norm and the expectation that data management and data archiving costs are included in the initial budget. And the important thing about that is that that funding ensures that the data will be fully available to the general public, as most many funding agencies do require. So what's included in the curation process um, that that funding pays for? Um, data enhancement. Um, the data specialists, data managers at ICP, ICPSR review and enhance the data, adding metadata, um, enhancing the technical documentation, to make sure that they're optimally usable and compliant with um, disclosure limitation standards. Long-term preservation. And that is a really, really important piece. Um, they ensure that regardless of changing technology in the future, that the data will always be available in usable forms. And everyone who has had the experience of having important documents saved on floppy disks or other formats that can no longer be read by current technology knows that keeping up with those changes in um, file formats uh, is really crucial. Protection of confidentiality is one of the other important services that they provide. And particularly because ICPSR is dealing with social and behavioral and health data that inevitably includes um, personal information about human subjects, the services of ICPSR to help anonymize data. They will remove identifiers. Um, they will really do everything necessary to safeguard sensitive data when necessary by using different levels of access. Um, and finally, ICPSR provides usage data not just in their data bibliography that helps to track publications that cite different data sets, but just the number of times that a data set has been accessed or downloaded. Now, going back to protection of confidentiality, which is one, again, one of the most crucial pieces that they provide. They perform a detailed review of all data sets um, added to the repository to assess them for disclosure risk. They'll modify data if necessary to protect respondents' confidentiality. 
where it isn't possible to modify the data without limiting the utility. They have methods of limiting access. And they also provide training for staff and consultation with data producers in methods to assess and mitigate exposure risk. Now for sensitive data, when it isn't possible to um, modify the data pr to protect confidentiality, um, there are different levels of restricted use that actually provide that protection. Starting with um, secure download, researchers are required to complete an online application, which would include a data usage agreement, and then the data is provided to them in an encrypted form using a secure link. More secure is the virtual data enclave where restricted data is made available using a virtual machine operating on a remote server. Essentially, this would provide the researcher access to the data in a way in which they could not um, download it to their own machine. They couldn't send it to anyone else. So it provides a fairly secure level of protection. But then the final is actually, I think of this as the bat cave, um, a physical data enclave where researchers are actually required to travel to Ann Arbor, Michigan and access the data in a physically restricted space on a um, specially configured computer that is not connected to the internet, to any networks. And most of the data that is restricted to that extent is very highly sensitive data, um, for example, of prison inmates or victims of violence. So what kinds of data can be deposited in ICPSR? Most of the data is quantitative and Data can be accepted in raw ASCII format um, with setup files provided, system files um, within a specific uh, data analysis program like SAS or STATA, um, or, and this is what's generally preferred, the portable file formats that are produced by those statistical programs. But um, the repositories also accept qualitative data, geospatial data, audio files, and video files. And here in particular, the curation staff will work closely with investigators to help anonymize that data wherever it's possible. So when should you start thinking about how to share your data and how to deposit it? Not at the end of your project. That's something that you should really be thinking about right from the start um, as part of your initial project proposal to ensure that your data is going to be um, available over the long term. And in order to really ensure that your data is going to be shareable, how can you make sure that you're following best practices for data management? If you're working with social science data or even other types of data, the ICPSR Guide to Social Science Data preparation and archiving, which is available from the ICPSR website under the Share Data tab, 
um, is about 50 pages of really critical information on everything from best practices in file naming, um, you know, how to construct the documentation, best practices in metadata, you know, reading that at the beginning of the data collection and data management process would really ensure your success in creating data that is um, truly shareable and available. And of course, if you need assistance with that, contact your librarian. Um, our data management at drexel.edu address will triage your questions to the person who's best capable of answering. Um, if you know who your subject librarian is, that's a good person to contact. Um, and if you're in one of my subject areas, please contact me for assistance. 